would like to start again. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Today's first session will discuss the digitization of uh, money and the future challenges. Um, when thinking about the future of uh, money, it's important to think at the same time um, about the history. And uh, the history of money has been always linked with the history of technology. A big invention was the idea of balance sheets and double entry bookkeeping. This allowed for the emerging of banking and uh, uh, banks. And this meant banks became places where all the various credits and debits of society came together in a single register. And again, banking led to the invention of central banking. And that was in the 17th century. In return for lending gold to the sovereign, the Bank of England acquired the right to print paper money, which could then be used by the people to pay their taxes. In a sense, this was the origin of modern monetary system. It would be fair to argue that um, over the next, let's say, 300 years, things didn't change that much. We've had ups and downs, booms and busts, but the basic principles of banking have remained remarkably uh, similar. That has changed over the last uh, 10 to 15 years. In this last period, uh, we are witnessing a spectacular development of computing technology. So, so now we have uh, uh, fintechs, a global spread of innovation in electronic payments, and of course, we have crypto assets. What I'm trying to say is the payments behavior has started to change. And this development is extremely important, uh, is key for uh, the central banks, for, for us as central bankers. So before I hand over to our speakers, let me just say a few words how we see it in the Austrian uh, National Bank. And here I'd like to offer you three points. First, at the top, at the top of our agenda um, concerning um, payment systems is the implementation of an independent European instant payment system, a system which will help us to better con control credit transfers in the euro area and, and to keep big data in Europe. Second, at the same time, we are convinced uh, that uh, we will still need cash in the future. And here I'd like to mention just two arguments for that. Cash contributes to consumer uh, protection, especially in a digitized world. And um, if I may say so, cash is great in crisis. And thirdly, what about bitcoins and uh, central bank uh, digital currencies? Well, the key word for our central bank, which might surprise you, is caution. Caution in the, in the sense that we don't see crypto assets, um, and I think uh, about uh, bitcoins, is an alternative uh, to established currencies. And we believe that uh, uh, crypto assets are more a vehicle for speculation and caution in the sense that the issue of central bank digital currencies could interfere too much uh, what you might call uh, in commercial banking activities. On this third issue, we will hear in a moment uh, from our panel uh, much more. Therefore, I'd like to uh, stop here. And let me come now to our uh, speakers. Um, on my left-hand side, I'd like to welcome very warmly Mr. Ulrich Binseil. Good morning. Uh, Ulrich Binseil has been Director General of Market Operation at the European Central Bank since 2012. Before joining the ECB, he had worked for the Deutsche Bundes Bundesbank and then for the European Monetary um, Institute, and uh, just to say a few highlights, um, and I cannot touch uh, all highlights, he chairs currently the ECB's Market Operations Committee, the Money Market Contact Group, and 
the bond market concept to it. And he's also professor at the Technische Universität Berlin and is author of many academic papers. And this morning, he will uh, talk to us about one form of central bank digital uh, currencies and will discuss the pros and cons, if I'm right. And um, uh, our second speaker on my right hand side is Andrei Kirilenko, also a very warm welcome to him as well. Um, and uh, good morning. And Andrei Kirilenko is currently director of uh, the Center for Global Finance and Technology at the Imperial College Business School, uh, school in, in London. And uh, before he joined uh, Imperial in 2015, he was professor of the practice of finance and the, at the MIT Sloan School of Management and also co-director of the MIT Center for Finance and uh, Policy. And uh, his work focuses on, uh, let me put it in that way, on the intersection of finance, technology, and regulation. And one of his focal point was high, or has been high frequency trading. And let me just add one uh, point that I believe is very important. Between 2010 and 2012, Professor Kirilenko served as chief economist of the US Commodity Futures Trading Commission, the so-called CFTC, uh, and I like to add it's one of the most important uh, um, supervisory authorities in the States. Today, he will present a risk-based classification of crypto assets, and uh, in particular, he is going to discuss the following uh, questions. Um, what fundamental economic problem do crypto assets solve that fiat currencies do not? which assets will survive, and what are the regulators up to? So now uh, i like uh, to hand over, but uh, sorry, uh, one last remark, if you uh, allow me to leave enough time for discussion, may I ask the speakers to respect a maximum uh, speaking time of uh, 20 to 25 minutes, and allow me to give you a signal in time when it's uh, coming to the end or should come into the end. But now I'd like to uh, hand over to Mr. Binsel. Mr. Binsel, the floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Friedrich. Thank you for inviting me and allowing me to speak about this topic, which is um, yeah, an interesting one. Um, so I have some slides with me. Um, so the topic is central bank digital currency financial system implications and control. And um, maybe the, to, to make the question maybe more relevant or interesting, um, I mean, this is a conference on 20 year of uh, the euro or so. So, and one session I think was called at some stage the next 20 years. So will we have ECB, DC, in 2039, that may be the concrete question, and I don't give the answer, but I have overall, I have more arguments, let's say added to the side that it could be than arguments against um, CBDC. So um, let me go, yeah, Mr. Priebel said so already, I'm talking maybe about one type of central bank digital currency. I think that broadly what I would say would also apply to others, but I'm not discussing really technology here. I assume, and then don't you know, try to generalize, that we talk here about conventional deposit money offered to everyone who wants to have an account with the central bank. Yeah? I don't talk about um, token money, about uh, non-central ledger, uh, forms of central bank digital currency, assume that we just have deposit accounts opened uh, to everyone. Uh, that is a, a quite, I would say, standard uh, technological solution. You just need to um, increase the number of accounts that you offer from a few thousand to a few hundred million. 
So the scaling is uh, not trivial, of course, but otherwise, technologically, it's not a revolution. It's very conventional um, technology. And um, the main point, maybe let me present it here to this slide, which hopefully you can uh, read. But I mean, if you look at, if you go to the literature on central bank digital currencies, you could say there are three big views and they go into very different directions. The first one, you could call it the idealistic view, um, or you could say, if you want to be negative, you could say the fantastic view partially, you know, on central bank digital currency. And the first one would be um, the one linked to sovereign money, you know, um, and sovereign money is uh, not, you know, an irrelevant idea. We had uh, last year in June the referendum on Vollgate uh, in Switzerland, uh, which was rejected with 75%. But still, some people believe sovereign money is the right answer to financial stability and other problems. So, central bank digital currency is viewed as a natural way to achieve um, sovereign money. Uh, second, some people and uh, those are, as an example, Ken, Ken Rogoff maybe believe that central bank digital currency is a way to overcome the zero lower bound problem. So if you uh, discontinue banknotes or bigger denominations, you can also overcome the problem that banknotes put a zero lower bound to monetary policy. Then some people say, some macroeconomists say you can enrich the macroeconomic monetary policy toolkit if you have central bank digital currency because you can put an independent interest rate on that form of monetary liabilities. Second type of views is the fearful, what I call here fearful conservative views. And the first two points I would say are mainstream concerns of central bankers, no? So, okay, more or less radically formulated, but there is a concern that if central bank digital currency is a super success. Um, it could really um, crowd out structurally the banking system and, you know, let the central bank balance sheet um, inflate compared, I mean, at the expense of the commercial banking system. And that would unavoidably lead to a centralization of credit allocation in the central bank. Second variant is that it would undermine stability so not a structural disintermediation, but if you want to call it this way, a cyclical disintermediation, that if there is a systemic banking crisis, all the deposits will flow into the central bank. And will, so CBDC facilitates an aggregate bank run on the banking system. Then I would say less mainstream amongst um, economists and central bankers are the next two fears. You know, one is that it's a further instrument of financial repression because it can be combined with the end of banknotes. So what some like, because you can put negative interest rates, others don't like in countries like uh, Germany or the Netherlands, that would be a popular counter argument. And then some people say it's an Orwellian instrument of control of money flows. So the opposite of what Mr. Friebel has said, banknotes are part of consumer protection of anonymity. So, of course, then you can have fears that this will be undermined. Then there's a third view, which I would call the pragmatic view of uh, Sverige Kriegsbank, the e krona project. No, I mean, none of all those arguments um, is very prominent, or the, the, the positive arguments mentioned so far are prominently brought forward by the Riksbank. No, the Riksbank is just saying it's a more efficient form of central bank money accessible to all. If banknote demand shrinks, like it's the case in Sweden, then it's good because you ensure state involvement in this crucial function for consumers. And because retail payment systems are of systemic relevance are, and have natural monopoly properties also, the state should better be involved and not leave it to the private sector. Um, and my, I mean, this paper is about really let's say, proposing a solution on the first two conservative, fearful points here. Yeah? How can we prevent um, structural and cyclical disintermediation of the banking system? And if that can be solved, okay, then of course still there's a debate if you want this tool or not, and maybe people don't want it, then it's easy. 
but if people want it, then I think there is a way to control those two problems, which are the main problems seen by central bankers. This is just, uh, I will skip this, this is presenting similar things, but now in a list of arguments of benefits of central bank digital currency ordered in a certain way. But it's not, let's say, my list, that's a list of arguments which have been made somewhere in the literature. Yeah? I'm not subscribing to all of those arguments, but let me skip it. And let me, um, I wanted to skip that one as well, but now I feel encar encouraged by Mr. Priebel to briefly go back into history <laughs> and the 17th century because you also referred to it. So, I mean, this is just to say um, that, um, let's say, debates on the form of central bank liability, you know, are very old now. And uh, the, the first central banks, if you want to call them like this, were only offering deposits with banknotes coming in only later. Um, and um, also then various instruments being tested, which were a sort of remote access to deposits. No? So if central bank digital currency is remote access to central bank account by household, we can say we had that um, already also in the 16th, 17th century, different attempts to solve uh, this uh, problem. Um, and um, maybe more relevant in the context of CBDC is that the starting point was universal access to deposit accounts. No, if you go back to the 16th, 17th, 18th century, there was no discrimination between, you know, banks, whatever banks were at this uh, stage, or non-financial corporates, or households, or governments. Maybe governments had their accounts systematically with those banks, but otherwise everybody who had money was allowed to deposit and to use um, the deposits as a means of payment. So all this is, I would say, very old, and here we just renew this. Um, and if we go to the um, 20th century, that's really the century where the focus on bank deposits um, or the restriction of deposits to banks plus the public sector w became effective. Now here's the, the example of the German central banks of the 20th century where non-bank non private deposits remained important in the first half of the century but then were brought down practically to zero towards the end. And if I'm not wrong, the Banque de France had um, household accounts in principle until 2000, no? They were allowed, they were then gradually phased out. But it's, you know, it's not a revolution to offer deposit accounts to households. Um, and this is something that remains in terms of non-bank deposit accounts. So that's the euro system. And if you go to the accounting guideline, the public accounting guideline of the ECB, you find those three items, 5.1, general government deposits, 5.2, other liabilities, and 6, liabilities to non-euro area residents denominated in euro. And so those accounts exist, and they were pretty alive during the last 10 years. In particular, uh, item 6, I mean, moved violently in uh, 2008. Yeah, um, and that's exactly what people uh, have in mind, maybe, when they are afraid of a bank run fa being facilitated by central bank digital currency. So here, um, official sector institutions, central banks from the rest of the world who had accounts um, with the euro system, I mean, put their money from the banking system into the central bank. Um, and of course, the euro system has tools to manage this because it can apply interest rates, the interest rates it wants to those accounts. And indeed it changed the interest rates, yeah. It made them, it changed the formula because the initial formula was anyway not foreseeing also negative interest rates. So at some stage the formula was changed. And of course the Euro system could have changed the formula more aggressively, no? Could have put very negative interest rates on those accounts to manage this. But, okay, this type of flows, you could say, were considered not problematic. I mean, if you say the revealed preference of the euro system has been to tolerate this, uh, those flows uh, in this way. Okay, now um, 
the core, <laughs> the core of the paper is about showing how to manage um, the flows created by central bank digital currencies and how to control the quantity. And the basis of that is to understand the flow of funds of central bank digital currency in a system of financial accounts. I mean, there are a few things that all economists will agree about, but one is that assets should always be equal to liabilities and that every financial claim is a financial liability of someone else. And those two things give you the discipline to be sure that you understand what's happening with the financial system if you move somewhere something, no? And maybe I don't have the time to go into the details, but let me mention two, just a distinction on in terms of central bank digital currencies. CBDC one in this financial account system is the one that goes at the expense of banknotes, yeah? If people say, ah, now I have digital central bank money, prefer to use it compared to banknotes, that's the green one, CBDC one. If instead um, households say, I'm happy to now have my central bank account, I take all my money from my bank account, put it into central bank digital currency, that's CBDC two in red, yeah? And of course the two have different flow of funds implications, yeah? Uh, and one is unproblematic and one is potentially problematic and needs to be managed. And then, I mean, what is else in this uh, system of accounts is what happens if the central bank tries to address central bank digital currency too by um, holding more um, government or corporate bonds to prevent that the banking system becomes more dependent on central bank credit. So this is also put in in the form of S1 and S2. And then I also put something called DL for deleveraging, what happens if the banking system deleverages, but let me not go to the detail. Um, I mean, what is, rel what is important at the end also for monetary policy is that if CBDC2, the red one, the dangerous one, is big, it means that the average financing costs of banks increase, no? Because uh, the interest rate on household side deposits is lower than the interest rate on central bank funding, is lower than the interest rates on bonds that the banks issue. So of course, if there are substitution effects between those resources, I mean, roughly the table shows that, uh, that there's a 100 basis point difference between those three categories, so plus 100 and plus another 100, so that you have, of course, a more expensive financing mix for banks. And what would central banks need to do? They would have to lower the central bank rate, no? So um, they would lower the central bank rate, but not in a way to exactly restore the average funding cost of banks, because there's a non-bank you know, financing source for corporates. So if you think about the neutral monetary policy after a big CBDC2 shift, it will be you know, a moderation of central bank rates, but higher funding costs of banks relative to capital market funding compared to before, and therefore also a shift from bank funding to capital market funding, no? And there's a, you know, there will be a kind of deleveraging of banks, naturally. Um, the, other, the other fear is the bank run fear, no? And here's again a system of financial accounts recalling that there are three types of bank runs, if you want. They are all similar in the sense that they take away uh, deposits from banks, but there are three types. One is shifting money from bank A to bank B, yeah? You know, when we had the Greek crisis, everybody brought money from accounts in Greek, Greece to accounts in somewhere else, yeah? So a shift between bank deposits, that's um, R1 in this system. Then we have a run into bank notes, yeah? That's, um, that's R2. And then we have uh, R3, that's a run into deposits with the central bank. I mean, that's what was, it was in, the, in the chart, no, what um, foreign central banks were doing in 2008, and what could be if you have central bank digital currency at a larger scale with household money. So this just puts all those flows into a system. But um, I have to hurry up, I think. This is just trying to capture the numbers for the, uh, I mean, for the Euro 2 crisis uh, over the last 10 years, but let me skip it. 
And let me now move into the question, how can we control the structural and cyclical um, disintermediation risks for the banking system? And uh, let's say the most um, sophisticated and ambitious paper that you find on this topic is the one by um, the Bank of England working paper by Kumhof and Noon um, from 2018. And they establish four principles and say, if you apply those four principles, then you have things under control. Um, and the principles are listed there. So that's a copy paste uh, from, I think, their abstract. So principle one, pay an adjustable interest rate on CBDCs, fine. But principles two and three are, I would say, quite revolutionary because they say, basically, don't, don't make CBDC convertible. So CBDC and reserves would be distinct and not convertible. And the same holds for bank deposits. They would not be convertible into central bank digital currencies at commercial banks. And that's, of course, I would say, quite um, deep changes. So I'm saying in the paper, here you are throwing out the baby with the bathwater, no? That you want to prevent that central bank digital currencies, you know, undermine the financial system as we know it. And then you do it by a non-convertible central bank digital currencies. I mean, central bank liabilities were always, different forms were always convertible into each other and that holds since the 16th century. So to me, that's a, an idea that may work theoretically, but that goes quite far. And um, the paper proposed an alternative, and that's interest rates, use interest rates for risk. And both um, the e Krona report and the Kumhof and Nune paper, they both refer to interest rates as a tool to control quantity. Um, but I think the feeling is that this tool may be not universally applicable because if you have a crisis, if you push the remuneration rate into negative territory to um, prevent big inflows into the central bank, there would be an outcry, you know, uh, an outcry of small savers, of um, you know, population, of political parties, of media, that you are now repressing or make people pay, you make, you know, the um, old people pay for the banking systems, uh, let's say reckless behavior or w whatever. Yeah? So solution that the paper proposes is to have a tiering system, no? And a tiering system is something that was, that is applied, you know, constantly by central banks. So if you look at a government, the um, remuneration of government deposits with the euro system, and also the remuneration of foreign central bank deposits we apply tiering systems, no? So there's a first tier, which is remunerated close to market rate, and then a second tier, which can be remunerated quite badly, no? And this you can also apply without, you know, any difficulty to central bank digital currency. And then you have to choose, of course, some parameters. You have to choose how big tier one would be, yeah? And here, just to make it concrete, assume that, um, or, or let's say again, the theory behind you would say, I want central bank digital currency to be a means of payment, but I don't want to be at a large store of value, no? Because uh, the public sector is not there to be an intermediary for store of value functions of money, because the public sector has no comparative advantage in managing financial assets on behalf of others, no? And that you impose by saying, thousand euro or whatever, is means of payment, I remunerate it nicely, and everything that goes beyond, fine if people want to hold it, because I don't want to control the quantity of it, I want convertibility at any price, but I control the amount with an interest rate. Yeah, I have to stop. Two minutes, yeah, that's good. So, so you know, and then put any formula, just to make it concrete, yeah, just put something, so here it says, uh, interest rates on CBD on uh, tier one would be the maximum of zero or the deposit facility rate, and the interest rate on um, tier two would be deposit facility rate minus two, just to make it concrete. And then this would look like this. So the red one 
is the tier two remuneration rate over the last 20 years as it would have been, and the green is the tier one remuneration rate, which never falls below zero um, to exactly prevent this um, sense of financial repression on the means of payment function of central bank money. Yeah? So it would end up having the same rem remuneration rate like banknotes. And here just to recall, we currently have a per capita a circulation of banknotes in the euro area of 3,000 euro. Yeah, so here 1,000 euro tier one is quite a moderate amount. Yeah. Um, yeah. Last point to make as, a, as an element of caution still, controlling the quantity of central bank digital currency is not equivalent to control its impact on the financial system. Because if, a, if households are fine, you know, with this tier one, tier two, but the accounts have sufficient account functionality that I can survive just with my central bank account and for the rest just need a non-bank broker to do my investments, then I can still close my account with the central bank, with the commercial banks, no? So even, and that's an example here, even if you have only central bank digital currency one, so not at all the problem of substitution of flow of site deposits with banks into the central bank, you could still have a big increase of the new, what is called your new non-bank intermediaries at the expense of banks because households no longer see a need to have a deposit account with banks. So controlling the quantity is not equivalent to controlling the effect on the financial system. And then you enter philosophical questions of whether it's the task of the central bank to prevent innovation, no. So if the world, you know, if central bank digital currency can be offered efficiently, okay, should we, should we say we don't want this to happen because we like banks? Not per se, no, we should say um, we of course have to be very careful with those things and manage them be aware of them and maybe be extremely slow in implementing such a thing because it is not peanuts even if we control the quantity, no? So that's it. Um, so overall, I think the quantity control problem is manageable, yeah? And with trivial solutions which have been tested by central banks, a tiered remuneration system, but still that doesn't mean that we will not have a big impact of central bank digital currency if it is a success. And at the end, of course, introducing it or not depends, I would say, on the demand for it. So if you have a progressive population, as maybe you have it in Sweden, and people want it, you know, they don't cry, uh, this is repression, this is the end of banknotes, maybe you can do it. But if you have very negative pushback from the population because emotionally they don't like it, then you better don't do it, of course. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Binsheim, for a very interesting and stimulating uh, presentation. And uh, I would like uh, to ask uh, Mr. Kirilenko for his speech, please. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot. I also have the slides. It's, it's great to be here. Uh, really appreciate uh, an opportunity to speak in front of this, in front of this audience. Uh, I will try to present to you uh, a taxonomy of crypto assets, of which CBDC will be one part. Uh, which, where, which is where it belongs. So we went back to the uh, 17th century with the double entry bookkeeping. Let me take you a little bit further. So let me take you to something called Cambrian Explosion. Cambrian Explosion was an event, a very, very important evolutionary event in, in, in the history of life on Earth, which happened about 20 to 25 million years ago. In the space of a very, very short time, uh, there was a, through fossil fuels, uh, through, through fossil just sort of records, it's been discovered that very, very simple life forms started becoming very complex. And uh, it coincided, uh, again, through, uh, so, so through, through the digging that, that, uh, that paleontologists have done, with an increase in oxygen level. So an oxygen level increased to the level where all of a sudden life form on Earth from single microorganisms started having basically what it started looking like what it looks like now. Uh, meaning that life forms started moving. It, they could now move on their own. They, they could see. 
eyes were developed at that point, proto-eyes, and then they started hunting each other for, for, for food. So all of that happened in a very, very short period of time. So evolution, according to this theory, happens in bursts. So for a long time, nothing happens, then something happens in bursts, coinciding with something else that happens, that happens at the time. Uh, what we've seen in, the, in crypto assets looks very similar to me, like a Cambrian explosion. And the, uh, the equivalent to uh, the level of oxygen in Earth, I would say, is due to something, again, it's a variety, led us to a variety of complex structures. We have crypto assets in the form of various tokens and in a variety of forms that they've presented. And uh, many of which, like in the Cambrian explosion before, went extinct. M most of those, the dominant majority of those, uh, is no longer the case. So what is, what is the analogy with oxygen that, that, that we could observe now? And that is Moore's law. So Moore's law is, and this is a variant of Moore's law. It's not really a law of physics. It's an observed sort of phenomenon. It's an exponential increase in the number of computation conducted by an integrated circuit at the same cost. At the same cost. Meaning that computing power has been exponentially becoming cheaper. And at one point, at around 2008, you had a point where the level of, this is the oxygen, Computing power is the oxygen. There is more and more of it at the same cost. And around 2008, you had a situation where there it reached a threshold where the computing power allowed for a possibility of the creation of the first, the prototype cryptocurrency, crypto asset, Bitcoin, which has become popular. It's not that it hasn't been tried with before. There are many elements of, of Bitcoin that have been present before uh, that, that people have experimented with, computer scientists have tried it. So uh, encryption and cryptography has been around for about 40 years. Uh, P2P communication has been around in a variety of form for about 20 to 35 years. Uh, but at this point, sort of Moore's law reached the level where something became possible. What became possible? What is the fundamental problem that gotten solved? The fundamental problem was digital technology, was a digital object, is that it could be an exact replica of a digital object could be created at pretty much zero marginal cost, which makes the concept of economic scarcity questionable. Because if I could create exact same replica of an object, exact, computer, not me, could create, then how do I know uh, wh what's the scarcity? You know, how can I not create a million of these, 10 million of this, a billion of these? So what blockchain technology has solved is introducing the concept of scarcity into the digital domain. And that's the fundamental economic value of it. Now, you could have a digital object that could be economically scarce. And if something could be economically scarce, we could, as an economist, could put value on it, and we can associate the risk associated with the scarcity of this object. Physical objects, a lot of the physical objects, real estate is, has fundamental scarcity component. There is a particular building or a particular apartment, and there is no other apartment which is exactly the same as that one, right? And so that creates a scarcity object. Commodities, uh, knowledge in various form is also, we managed to figure out how to make it scarce. For the first time, we now have a digital record that could be scarce, and that gives rise to a possibility of creating assets on the back of this technology. So I have to confess, the first time I met the founders of Ethereum, which was around 2013, it was in some basement near MIT, I thought, I want to stay out of these people. This is a religious sect. I, they don't know what they're talking about. I just lived through the financial crisis. I was a regulator. These people are smoking something really bad. This is not for me. <laughs> I overlooked 
at the time this economic concept. I did, I confess. It took me a bit of time to, uh, to wake up to it, to see it, uh, and, 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 and understand really fundamentally how, 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 how really critical that is. I have subsequently invested quite a bit of time into learning that, and actually won the journey that, uh, that, that many people have, subs that some people have subsequently won, I decided, you know, the best way to understand what it is is really to start coding on a blockchain, just to see what it's like. When we start coding on the blockchain, you really have to start solving these sort of things. Double entry booking. What does it exactly mean? How do you exactly create, you know, you give someone something, someone gives you change, and then you enter it here and it enters there. And then you start understanding the power of it because you're like, huh, okay, that's what it does. That now it makes sense. Uh, so based on that, I started thinking and I thought, okay, so can we actually figure out some sort of a framework for crypto assets, because I see many of them. Uh, and this is what I sort of came up with. It, you know, I, to, 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 it, you know I, I wanted to have something that could fit on a two-dimensional grid. So I have only two dimensions here. One dimension is, on the x-axis, is the uh, probability, the risk of not being adopted. So the risk of not being adopted zero means that it's adopted with 100% probability nearly. 100% probability risk of not being adopted means that it's, it's highly speculative. The reason for this, for this being one minus the probability is that so we can have this, this curve, uh, the, 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 these, this sort of sliding up. And on the, on the vertical axis, you know, I'm a financial economist, I put expected return. So you have expected return. Both of these things we could actually model. Uh, I, have, I have some frameworks and people have been looking at it uh, how we can model it. So what's expected return? So just to remind you, an expected return is uh, probabilities times payoffs summed over. So these probabilities do not have to be rational. They could be just some probabilities. You have a probability measure, you have a distribution from which you draw. It does not have to be a normal distribution. It could be bimodal, trimodal distribution with fat tails, skewed, whatever. It's just probability distribution. There is a certain probability of a payoff occurring. And remember, because if it's done that way, uh, if you have a payoff of a million with a probability of 1% and all the other payoffs being zero, then it still has positive expected return, right? So we have equilibrium frameworks of how we think in finance. We spend quite a bit of time actually modeling expected returns. We could have expected returns and we can put risks on the back of it as well. We can build them into a probability distribution or we can take them out of the probability distribution and add it as a risk premium. You're all familiar with risk neutral versus w w with the additional risk premium on top of it. We can actually plug that right back into the probabilities and then you will have the realized probabilities or probabilities that, are, that incorporate risks. So we have frameworks for this, so we can model this. What I'm trying to do is, I'm trying to look at this whole Cambrian explosion thing, and I want to put in some sort of a framework that we could use, and we can take to data. Because ultimately, I want to introduce a framework, I want to take it to data and see if it works, it doesn't work, but it's a step in that direction. Second bit is, uh, what about the probability of adoption? How can we think of a probability of adoption? Well, we, uh, let's, just, let's just say that we reduce the probability of adoption to a couple of attributes. And I'll just introduce two attributes. One attribute is security, and the other attribute is stability. So you can think of that security is sort of a technological attribute. An asset is more secure, a crypto asset or, or any asset is more secure, if there is a lower risk of fraud, manipulation, abuse, and attack. In the case of crypto assets, you can think of higher security is associated with better, more advanced encryption protocol. In the case of banknotes, it's associated with the uh, you know, better physical security of printing on certain paper or whatever with, with certain holograms on it. In the case of, of uh, bank deposits, it's associated with protection. You know, typically banks are you know, associated with, you know, very large buildings with massive walls that's supposed to signify security of your assets inside somewhere, right, in the safe. Uh, the other uh, element is stability of a crypto asset. So what's stability? Stability 
has to do with governance. If you have governance that relies on existing codified laws and regulations, you're very stable. You're actually embedded already into the existing system and you have the whole power of the state behind you. Uh, if you're relying on, uh, let's say, a particular decentralized consensus algorithm, then you're less stable, but it, you're still stable to some extent, right? So many of you have looked into, into the governance and consensus. Consensus is fundamental, fundamental issue that has to be solved. In the case of Bitcoin, it was sold in a very, sold in a very expensive way, but solved nonetheless in a very distributed fashion. So probability of adoption is going to be a choice, again, an, an optimal choice. We, we have some model behind it. Between security and stability, that's how you're going to be making choices based on sort of expected return that has to be offered to you. So based on that, we can basically group, roughly speaking, assets, crypto assets into sort of four groups. Uh, central bank digital currencies, stable coins, so uh, the, uh, I would say, cryptocurrencies, and then crypto tokens. Uh, let me touch a little bit, just, just a little bit on, just to illustrate for you, since you've heard about central bank digital currencies, what would it look like within this framework? So central bank digital currencies are, very importantly, digitally native, digitally native, right? They exist in digitally native form. There are instruments that can be used to pay for any good or service in the financial asset in one transaction. So there are technological advantage, technological advantage is being digitally native. Uh, they are secure through encryption protocol or they're secure through, through, uh, uh, through uh, access protocol. And they are, um, stability is if, 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 they, if, if the central bank says this is what we're using, then that, that sort of governs their stability. Their economic advantage, what's the main economic advantage of having is getting access to the payment system. So as, as you've heard, the currently access to the payment system is, is only in, in dominant majority of important jurisdictions is only given to banks. Now, if you give access to the payment system to non-banks, that's what fundamentally then becomes the uh, central bank digital currencies th in this form. So there's a, there's a paper by the PIS that came out that says that you know innovation for general purpose users, but not for false identities. So uh, that sort of basically enabling non-bank institutions, including all the way to, to private individuals having accounts in central banks, i.e. participating in the payment system. Um, so um, the probability of non-adoption of such an asset would be very, very low. So it will be adopted through, uh, through, uh, through uh, central bank regulation. Uh, so as a result, the actual expected rate of return on it could be negative. Uh, participants would be actually willing to pay for convenience of having it. Convenience of having access to the payment system costs money in the form of negative expected return. So in principle, we could have this particular asset. This is very stylized. Uh, just have a negative expected return here somewhere uh, for the convenience of having access to it. Uh, as you've heard before, it, it is actually a very, very non-trivial, a very, very important feature of this particular asset because of the zero lower bound, which could be exploited uh, and used for, for, uh, for very, very important purposes, including uh, in, including, the, the including monetary policy. So uh, where would a central bank digital currency make sense from this perspective? Where would it make sense? So let's go back to Moore's law. I feel that the central bank digital currency sort of would not make sense in countries that have value added in their economy come in from physical transformation. If you're an economy based on extraction, of natural resources, if you're an economy based on services uh, with value added from there, if you're an economy that basically has to do with sort of non-digital fundamentally, then 
it's not entirely clear why would you be introducing the power of Moore's law underneath that. Where would it make sense is that if you have in your jurisdiction a, uh, a major business or several businesses which are powered by Moore's law, if you have Alibaba, if you have Netflix, if you have Facebook, if you have Uber in your jurisdiction, then having companies like that basically take advantage of Moore's law in the form of payments, access to the payment system and access to the digital native instrument could make sense because they are potentially being constrained from utilizing the full power of Moore's law. Uh, so, I mean, one sort of counter thought of that is, as you know, in finance, we have different ways to, to, uh, to value different assets. We value equity one way, we value commodity another way, we value it swaps another way. So we don't have a universal theory of asset valuation. So, and the equity, the way we sort of value equity is that we say, okay, equity, the value of equity is um, discounted net present value of future stream of dividends. Well, technology companies have never paid dividends. So what's the value of Apple stock? Like, where does our theory tell us what the value of Apple stock? You see, it's like this, right? So my guess is that because it's powered by Moore's law, it's basically our theory is just doesn't work for some of these assets. And they're using you know, equity as, as a means to raise capital, but it reflects completely different forces than we were modeling before. And so if they're enabled to use in their digitally native business, digitally native form of, of, of you know, sort of assets, uh, that, then that would make sense. Uh, otherwise, if you're an extraction economy, it probably doesn't make sense. So let's move on. Let's talk a little bit about crypto tokens. I'm not going to talk about cryptocurrencies. I'm not going to talk about stable coins. I could. We could during the conversation. Five more minutes to go. Brilliant. So, um, so crypto tokens. Um, uh, there is, it's a high risk opportunity, very high risk opportunity, right? So uh, some of them are outright fraud, some of them are just going to fail for a variety of reasons. So it's, it's, it's a highly, highly risky asset uh, in, in the sense that it's potentially highly unstable and, and, and uh, not secure. Uh, the failure rate, however, of uh, initial coin offerings that, that, that you know, the, the, uh, the, the mechanism for the issuance of crypto tokens is actually on par with early st stage alternative sort of private equity financing. So they're not like, <coughs> excuse me, off the charts in terms of failure rate. Yeah, they fail, you know, but m dominant majority of private equity offerings also fail. So it's not like we are looking at an asset class that's particularly off the charts. It's very, very risky. If you look at returns, so this is sort of a very geometric Brownian motion looking thing, with the two thick lines in the middle are the two dominant cryptocurrencies and crypto tokens around them. You see that a large, you know, a number of crypto tokens offer returns, realized returns, not expected returns, but uh, that are higher than cryptocurrencies, which is consistent with the view that we had before. Uh, so adoption is again driven by many aspects, but let's let's look in particular at at what these things are. So the adoption, if it's driven by security and stability, the basic idea is that lower security and lower stability would mean that you have to offer investors higher expected return associated with some probability measure measure underneath it. Interesting aspects for some of the tokens uh, about how how they're treated. So. Um, in what, where is it on the seniority scale? Like in the typical financing scheme of a, of, a, of, a, of a company, you have debt, which is senior, and then you have equity, which is junior. Uh, in, it's not entirely clear where the um, crypto assets are, where crypto tokens are. Sometimes they're more senior than debt. Sometimes they're more junior than equity. So they actually migrate up and down on the seniority scale. And that is actually a very interesting aspect of them. So where, where would crypto tokens make sense, again, from, this, from the sense of scarcity and Moore's law? Uh, it would make sense to use crypto tokens in digitally native activities, especially in digitally native activities 
that have to do with the production of digital value added, which could basically be powered by Moore's law. If you're writing software, uh, crypto tokens make a lot of sense. You can pay your developers or you can pay those who adopt your particular bit of software in crypto tokens. It makes a lot of sense because there is Moore's law underneath one, there is Moore's law underneath the other. If you're running a flower business and you are issuing crypto tokens, that makes no sense. Like what's Moore's law underneath the flower business, right? So, uh, uh, or, or some other sort of physical transformation business. So that's, that's, uh, that's the, um, that's, that's the <coughs> just sort of fundamentally how I think about it and how I distinguish different, different types of crypto assets, whether they, they sort of fundamentally make sense or not, tokens in particular. Last, very last bit and the last minute, what about regulation of crypto assets? So as you know, there are two types of regulators. Uh, you, you know, you, you mostly hear central bankers or so prudential regulators. I was a markets regulator, markets regulator. And so there is a very distinct now dichotomy that's, that's happening. It's pretty balkanized right now around the world, but markets regulators are basically being forced to make decisions, whereas prudential regulators could be cautioned for the next 50 years. You know, they could just say, look, you know, wh why would you regulate it? Typically, you regulate because you have a mandate, monetary policy mandate, financial stability mandate, payments mandate, consumer protection, fair and orderly markets, right? Is this a monetary policy mandate issue? Potentially not. Is this a financial stability issue? Too small. Is this for payments? You can just say, well, it doesn't go through the payment system. So you can sit on it and say, we're gonna be conservative. We're gonna see how these things develop. Something happens, maybe it makes sense, something doesn't. Markets regulators, different category. People come to you and they say, I want to list this on my exchange. You have to make a decision. And you, know, you, you better be justified in making your decision based on the current law and regulation because you can't just say, I don't feel like it. So you see that a lot of markets regulators around the world have been forced through applications from the private sector to allow for crypto exchanges, to allow for crypto assets being listed, clearing. You can clear crypto assets. So uh, on the market side, a lot is happening and it would, it will continue happening and potentially then spill over into other things. So uh, uh, many, many different question, interesting questions we can potentially ask about it and hopefully we'll have a very nice debate around it. Thanks very much. Thank you so much for your insightful uh, talk and uh, very interesting uh, presentation. And um, yes, it's, uh, it's around 10 o'clock. We have another 15 minutes to say it roughly. And I would like immediately to open the floor for discussion. Uh, yes. <coughs> yeah. yeah, the microphone is coming. So I, I'm Stefan Gerlach from UFG Bank. I have three, I have three questions here. It seems to me that in 700 years, we're not gonna have coins and banknotes anymore. So we will necessarily move into this direction. So is the key question really whether digital currencies should be issued by the central bank or by the private sector? And if the private sector does it, does not the history, sort of monetary history tells us that private uh, currencies Digital currencies as well are very unlikely to um, stay alive. We have lots of history of fraud and so on and so forth. Second question. Will we necessarily in the beginning have to maintain also physical currency and physical banknotes? Will not the problem be easier as to have a f full change into one from one system uh, to the next? Third question. Um, so if you have a digital currency, does it have to be uh, sort of a central bank or a public sector digital currency? Does it have to be issued by the central bank? Would it make sense to, for instance, set up a new, a new institution, a new public institution, perhaps uh, with the central bank as, as an owner and perhaps also the private banking system as an owner, to have sort of a, a private-public sort of partnership uh, in order to get this, uh, these questions about the management of the system away from the central bank, because this will take a lot of uh, time and effort, and it's, it's quite different, quite distinct, I think, from the rest of uh, central banking. Thank you very much. Um, I 
would say I, I collect two other questions and uh, then uh, probably could uh, start the first round of answers. Please. Um, and then yeah, we'll yeah, uh, Ludger Schuchner from the OECD. Oh, just uh, an observation question. Um, I, I, do you also see a risk, I mean, in this discussion of using um, digital currency, crypto tokens, whatever, as a means to have negative interest rates? I mean, are you aware of uh, the uh, very difficult debate that is happening in fiscal policies around wealth taxes because negative interest rates are nothing but a wealth tax. And, uh, you know, I mean, I think um, the, the, the debate should not be led in isolation, not in a silo, not in a bubble. Um, the second observation, just following this remark, I, I totally disagree. I, I would be very surprised if uh, currencies become purely electric, uh, electronic or whatever. I mean, we have now paper money, which is in a way a great sign of trust, um, and uh, it's, it's, it's a convention which uh, requires a lot of trust. And um, so I, I doubt that uh, we, we will have that kind of trust at some point where we'll get, a lot, get by without any, uh, any, any cash, uh, anything that is cash. On the contrary, my, my suspicion would be that over time will go in the opposite direction. But anyway, that's just speculation. Thank you very much. Uh, Doris Ritzberger, Austrian Central Bank. I want to link the topic of this session to a session which we have had yesterday on the international role of the euro. And yesterday we were told that uh, number one is still the US dollar and uh, it's very difficult to increase the share of the euro in this, uh, in this uh, market of international currencies. And um, um, maybe or very likely the Chinese uh, will be in front of us in certain time span. Uh, is it possible that this uh, digital currency is a very important element uh, in this run up to become the number one, that uh, when you miss it, uh, uh, you have a certain risk uh, that the others are much quicker and uh, that it's an issue in this uh, debate on the international role of the currencies. And uh, at the moment, uh, it looks to me that it's a very domestic-oriented concept. Uh, in this case, it's a euro-area-oriented concept. But when you open up those who can have an account at the central bank, you can invite nearly everybody to have an account at the central bank. And this is a, a, a main element of the debate in Sweden, for instance, where uh, I remember a discussion where a Greek colleague said, Great, I will come and transfer all my money to the Swedish Riksbank because uh, I trust much more into this central bank. Uh, so what about this? Is this an element? And uh, uh, besides all the hesitation, we all have much of us, uh, some of us more, some of us less, but still, isn't it worthwhile to look at this much more deeper and to have an eye on it? Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. Um, so first, uh, Stefan's question, should it be public or private sector? I mean, if it's a central bank digital currency, that's the idea of a public sector um, digital currency. And maybe again, we should not um, mix technological innovation with the topic of access of everyone to the deposit form of central bank liabilities, no? But um, I would say we have already private sector digital currency if you define central bank digital currency like this because we use all electronic access to our deposit accounts with banks, no? So here the point is that you would offer the same with accounts with the central bank and that makes it central bank digital currency. Do we need to discontinue banknote at the same time? No, unless you have in mind you know, some of the special benefits, or if you say, I mean, the, the, the two concrete ones are uh, total control of terrorist financing and money laundering, no? 
then, I mean, discontinue banknotes completely and monitor the flows in your central bank digital currency. And um, the other is if you want to impose negative interest rates at a large scale, then you need to discontinue banknotes. And that's what the IMF, this, I mean, Ken Rogoff's book on, um, on uh, the curse of cash goes in this direction, essentially, no? I mean, those people at the IMF who wrote that all the crisis would have been overcome quickly if we would have been able to put interest rates to minus 4%. And those people who believe into it, they would say discontinue banknotes and then you have this under control. Um, do we need a new institution, private-public partnership? I mean, the Sveriges Reichsbank, they want, or, or they say this can well be managed by a third-party provider, the technicalities, but still it's in the book of the central bank. And then you can combine, you know, the, the best of two worlds, ideally, indeed. Um, so, yeah, uh, Lutka, I mean, as mentioned, some people yeah, believe into negative interest rate policies, and, um, but some people dislike the idea fundamentally, and that's, I think, maybe the majority view in, in Germany, certainly. And, um, yeah, I would say the, those who are most concretely discussing, like the Swedes, no, on introducing this type of um, central bank liabilities don't, don't say at all they view it as a tool to impose negative interest rates. Of course, people may be suspicious and say once you have it and banknotes are gone, then you will come up with uh, those ideas. But it's not a necessary component of central bank digital currencies. Um, and I mean, you say you, you believe into cash, into banknotes. Um, I mean, 100 years ago or, or still 50 years ago, people could not imagine that that uh, money would be linked to anything else than gold, no? <laughs> People got used to, uh, to a paper standard, um, and um, I don't know. I think you have most of your investments not in the form of banknotes at home, so you trust also something else. So I wouldn't see really this to be an issue, that you cannot uh, trust an account that you have with the central bank compared to some banknotes that you hold, no? I mean, the banknotes can be the value, the purchasing power of banknotes can also be, can disappear with inflation. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't see a difference um, emotionally compared, uh, I mean, in terms of uh, trust I could have into a digital central bank money. And uh, the link to um, the international role of the euro, it's an interesting one. And as, as you say, Doris, it has been more perceived as a risk and a danger that indeed if you open those accounts to the whole world, you can have a global run. I mean, what we have seen with this liability item six in the Euro system balance sheet that the official accounts went up by 200 billion in a few weeks in 2008. You could have, you know, at an infinite scale. And, uh, and to manage this, I would say there are two, two main tools. First, you don't open, I mean, being a resident is a first condition. And then you can still have your cousin, of course, in, in Sweden and then um, you use your cousin, but then, okay, you need this tiering system, no? And you need to be able to control very large inflows with very large negative interest rates. And I wouldn't know why this wouldn't work, no? You could even have a three-tier system where, you know, a third tier is at minus 50%, yeah? So I think interest rates can be applied, can be ultra-negative to control this type of inflows, yeah? But you would always have the tier one, you know, to address people who say this is a financial repression instrument, you say from the beginning, we want it to be a means of payment. Experience says means of payment, 1,000 euro is enough. If you want to hold more, fine, but don't rely, don't tell us that we are doing financial repression if later on in the financial crisis we put a negative rate on tier, tier two or tier three. Mr. Just, yeah, just a couple of points. Uh, on, on, on the first point, on. Uh, on, on digital versus physical form. Um, uh, Moore's Law is a very powerful force. You know, I, as, as you've heard, I, I come to uh, technology and money and payments from technology and markets. And technology and markets, Moore's Law and markets has done interesting things. We, we basically no longer have financial assets, stocks and bonds that exist in the physical form. They just don't. So, uh, y you know, the, what is money if not an asset that you can exchange for other assets? You know, so the, the view that there will be some sort of a fundamental uh, attachment to it is 
is, is contradictory to what happened in, in other parts of the financial markets. Uh, the very interesting th things, however, happen when, when assets become uh, digitally native in that it gives rise to uh, technological competition within, within, within that sphere. Uh, and that, is, uh, that sort of brings us to China. I, I've been looking a little bit to uh, sort of fintech in China versus fintech in the, um, let's just call it the Western world. And they're powered by very, very different principles. Uh, fintech in China and fintech in the Western world. Fintech in the Western world, for all, for all it's worth, is, is still based on democratic values and the principles of competition. Fintech in China is not. Uh, I'll give you an example. So uh, for some reason, I've been on a bunch of panels of like large Chinese fintech companies. Uh, there's a company called Ant Financial, and it's a company that has an Alipay underneath it. So, uh, so what they do is the following. So here is their promotion strategy. Uh, the promotion strategy of, of Chinese fintech is through you know, tens of millions of Chinese individuals who are going around the world, and they show up in the store and say, okay, we want to buy something. Do you accept this? And, they, and the merchant says, no, we don't. Two weeks later, someone from Ant Financial says, we're going to ins uh, install the terminal here for free. For free. You pay nothing for it. So next time people come in, they could, they could pay using Alipay. Two weeks later, they come in and say, okay, through our terminal, you can now process all payments for free. All. Visa, MasterCard, anything else. So that's not principles of competition, if you ask me. Right? So now they collect all the information that was flowing through that. That's the purpose of it. And, and that also part, part of the question about money, you know, central bank money versus private money. Since we're in Austria, it's, you know, appropriate to bring in Friedrich Hayek. He spoke about, he, he wrote about private money. And uh, as you remember, his, his original concept of why capitalism is going to win over, you know, socialism or whatever other stuff is because of information. Information is dispersed throughout the economy and prices aggregate information, and that's a better allocation system. So information is dispersed through various forms of money and payments. And so it's not necessarily clear that it has to go the way it goes now and centralized in this non hayekian form. He was actually quite, quite open about it. I think we have a lot of power that now we can use underneath these sort of Western values and capitalist system that is now not flowing through that. It's flowing through you know, highly, highly centralized uh, sort of structures. That's sort of the ideology behind it, but it translates into very, very, very important things about, you know, who, who is going to be in the front of this technology race. Thank you. Unfortunately, time is running out, but uh, I would propose to uh, have two, two short questions. The first is in the first row, and then I see one hand up uh, behind. Is that still? Yeah. Sorry, the on the last point we discussed later, um, it seems to me perfectly competitive. In but your own uh, analysis shows why it's a problem. You've got essentially limitless economies of scale. In a system with limitless economies of scale, all standard competition models break down. Um, but the question I had is really for you. Um, if I got the sense of what you were saying, which I understand completely from where you are, and it's certainly not the Kumov paper, which I've read, I've written about this, a very important aim of all this is, is as it were, not to destabilize traditional banking. But the question is, in the medium to long run, why the hell should we not want to destabilize traditional banking? It's an absurd system. And it's only the result, no, it's the result of limited, limited information technology capacity, limited information capacity in a system that evolved 600 years ago, 500 years ago. And the result is we have money, nearly all money is bank liabilities. It's, they are the liabilities of highly leveraged institutions with, which hold risky assets, and therefore they are endemically and systemically crisis prone. We can get rid of that nonsense. Why not? Embrace the opportunity. Short answer will be difficult, but anyhow, we have a, 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 a another one. Another question, yeah. Uh, 
uh, Jursulin Prime Minister's Office, Finland. Uh, actually, I have just one question for Mr. Kirilenko uh, regarding your last last point. Also, uh, because I think you referred to Mr. Hayek on this sort of the, how the capitalisms will prevail because of its parallel computing capabilities or so. Uh, and this, in this respect, um, I think people have read all around the news that Bitcoin, for example, Bitcoin, one of the biggest problems with Bitcoin as a, as, as a potential replacement for bank money is that uh, basically it becomes, the computational burden becomes too expensive in terms of energy costs if you if you if you're willing to scale up the system uh, uh, on a global basis so my question is simply uh, it's a technological question but w what is what is the state of play at this time i mean i know that these consensus algorithms have improved but but still i guess there are lots of challenges in terms of uh, for example energy consumption when it comes to scaling thanks Thank you. Um, now I would like to start with Professor Kirilenko. Yeah, thanks. So on, on the first question, uh, in the, um, as, as you said, in, on, under Moore's law, not all forms of competition break down. Winner takes all does not break down. So you see in technological competitions, you very, very quickly emerge in a situation where there's a monopoly, you know, so, uh, and because, you know, small marginal gains, you know, very quickly lead to consolidation, right? So, uh, and we've seen it in, in a variety of markets you know, the where, where, where that's applicable. That's an issue, right? It's an issue because, you know, regulators around the world are trying to be figure out what to do with global technology companies now under what regulatory framework. On the consensus mechanism, fantastic question. So uh, certainly uh, Bitcoin and the way the proof of work consensus mechanism works is, is, is uh, as has been rightly pointed out, is is, is, is very, very expensive, and there are ways to go about it. But it reminds me, I've done a bit of work, as you know, on, on commodities, just proper commodities. And I don't know how, you know, I sort of learned to realize over time that things that actually work, like futures contracts or swaps, or even money for that matter, seem to be accidental. They're like accidents. Like, you know, like people have tinkered with a variety of things, and all of a sudden, one of them just sort of takes off. Just to remind me of the you know, history of commodity futures, for example. Uh, before commodity futures in the you know, mid-19th century sort of came in towards later the 19th century came into being in, in Chicago, literally farmers would come to Chicago with wheat in the fall and dump their wheat in the lake because prices were so low that it was uneconomical for them to transfer it back. Now, if you can sell your wheat forward, all the waste is done. So is it now more wasteful What's more wasteful, dumping your wheat into the lake or just sort of other things? We've seen evidence of, you know, without before financial innovation of things just sort of not working out. It took about 20 to 30 years before, you know, futures contracts sort of reached the form and a number of things had to be solved, including consensus, which was done through a form of clearing, right, breaking down counterparty risk before these things could be solved. Uh, I think things are being sold very, very fast in the distributed ledger technology space. I recently judged a couple of hackathons on that. The amount of talent working on distributed ledger, not on cryptocurrencies, but on distributed ledger, is staggering. Very, very talented people are working to solve problems, including consensus problems. So it's, uh, it will be solved. Currently being sold enterprise level is for centralized blockchain applications, but increasingly less centralized. So uh, it, it, things are happening. Thanks a lot. Thank you. And uh, yeah, I think, um, think no, I mean, cent central banks are not there to pro, I mean, to prevent progress towards a better world if we find better solutions. I think everybody will agree at the same time that central banks should not manage at large scale information intensive investments, no? So if you allow the central bank balance sheet to balloon, I mean, in the case of the euro area, we have around, I think, 7 trillion of um, side deposits with banks. If all that goes into the central bank, you could say, um, yeah, what do we hold on the asset side, which is not information intensive, no? Um, and we could say, yeah, we just hold all the central government bonds of the euro area, which is more or less the same order of magnitude, no? Okay. Um, 
thinkable, yeah. But then there's no safe asset left in the private sector, okay. So, I mean, there are lots of repercussions. And then the other one is that, of course, bank funding costs um, become higher. Banks, um, to the extent that they want to maintain a balance sheet, they would have to um, yeah, finance in capital markets at higher costs, okay. But maybe there is a long-term equilibrium, which is fine, and this would be a better world with better financial stability. Still, of course, central banks have to acknowledge that transition is, is an issue and that financial stability and transition has to be managed and they would have ha to take responsibility to manage it in an orderly way. So, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we are a little bit behind our time schedule, but anyhow, I think it was a very interesting and lively discussion and uh, therefore, I think um, we are very fine, at least I think yeah, here in the panel we are fine, yeah? <laughs> yeah. So, um, thank you uh, so much.